EP1100 data communication and computer networks. Now we move over from local area networks to wide area networks. These are networks with many links and nodes. So why not only one node? Well, obviously, if you, that node fails, the whole network is gone. And the scalability is uh, obvious also. If you only have one node, you'll need a lot of cables, and that uh, becomes uh, costly. So it's not a good idea. So instead you have a, a network design problems. You have locations where you want to cover and you have to optimize the number of links and the number of switches to cover those nodes. This requires forecasting of the communication demands in terms of the number of nodes that should communicate and the need they have of, of communicating. This forecasting is an ongoing problem because networks are never finally built. They are first initially built and then they are upgraded and expanded indefinitely. In this lecture, I want to go over various principles of networking in the wide area. Looking at the switch networks for wide uh, area networks, some principles for that, congestion that occur in packet switch networks, and routing principles. Wide area network communication includes the public telephony. In the countries where the internet infrastructure is very good, this network has been disabled. But in our many countries, there still is a separate telephone network, which is separate from internet. Then we have the internet itself, and then we have a large number of corporate private networks. Could be exchange of uh, data, uh, transactions between banks, could be the airline reservation system, and, and many other examples. So we talk about public and private networks where the public networks are networks that are owned by a company uh, that provide a service to customers. In the old times, these customers were referred to as subscribers, as you may ha hear that term still. Here the management and the maintenance is not the user's responsibility, because that's provided as part of the service from the company running the network. And there were private networks. These can be privately owned, and they're secured and controlled access, so only authorized users can, can, can use them. For companies that, that run the pri their private networks, this is a large ex investment and they need the technical expertise to manage and do all the work of having a network running. Because of that reason, we now see a lot of virtual private networks. These are networks that are private for the company that, that uh, has them, but they are leased from a public operator. So there could be resources reserved for the virtual private network, but they use an infrastructure that could also be used for public net, uh, communication services. This is a more cost-effective uh, solution, but of course it shares infrastructure with the public communication services, and there could be attacks on such a network that you might avoid if you have your own secured infrastructure. Here is the general structure of a switched network. The circuits represent the switching nodes. They act on a network layer header and forward packets from link to link. We call these switching nodes routers in the internet. Here we consider the switching nodes which operate at the networking protocol layer, so above the data link layer. The boxes are the end nodes that communicate. They send and receive data and they're connected via the switching nodes. They're called hosts for the internet. And the lines are the links, that are the data links between nodes and operate on a physical and data link layer. There are several switching principles that are worth knowing. The most basic subdivision is between circuit switching and packet switching. Then there is a subdivision of packet switching into virtual circuit switching or connection-oriented packet switching and datagram. I will go over these different modes. Circuit switching is the traditional telephony network switching. The name comes from the original analog telephone system where there was an electrical circuit established from one telephone to another. And the microphone in one telephone generated an electrical signal that traveled through this circuit to the loudspeaker of the receiving telephone. When this system was digitalized, then uh, the voice became pulse code modulated at uh, 8,000 samples 
per second at 8 bits per sample. And these samples were then time division multiplexed on the shared links. So circuit switching relies on fixed channels on all the shared links. It could be time division multiple axis, as in the telephony case, or frequency division multiple axis, or in optical networks, wavelength division multiple axis. When a circuit is established, each node makes a routing decision. It has to decide which of possibly several outgoing links it should use for the circuit. And then it reserves resources. That means it reserves slots in a frame for TDMA or reserves a frequency or wavelength channel for the other two multiplexing modes. This gives a fixed resource reserved for the connection between the two communicating entities. And the data transfer can only use that resource, and the resource is reserved even though they do not use it. When a connection is disconnected, when there is no need for them to communicate any longer, then the resources are released and can be used by others. Packet switching is a different principle. Here, data is transmitted in packets. They correspond to the frames that are being sent on a link on the data link protocol. It means that large messages are broken up into a number of packets. The messages could be files from Word or Excel or other programs that you use, or they could be uh, films, music, whatever is being transferred to the network. All will be broken down into packets and sent over the network. The switches are based on a principle called store and forward. It means that they receive packets on an input. It processes the address to determine which output the packet should go to. And then it buffers them. And when the output link is available, it will transmit them. So here we talk about packets. But what are the differences between a frame and a packet? Think about that. So we've seen the properties of circuit switching, but what are the properties of packet switching? Well, a link capacity is dynamically shared, so it means that the time division here is asynchronous, and we usually refer to that also as statistical multiplexing. That means that traffic can have changing bit rates, so a computer that transfers files can use the link maybe for a longer time when it's sending files, but then it can remain idle for a long time, and then other computers can use the, the link. So there's an interleaving of traffic from different senders completely asynchronously. It also means that the link can be used by connections of different bandwidths. So it's not a fixed channel as in the circuit switching case, but here a film, for instance, of very high quality of uh, requiring tens of megabits per second could share a link with a Skype call of 100, a few hundred kilobits per second. And as said, the packets are stored and delayed in the switching. We refer to this as queuing. And this queuing creates a delay that is non-deterministic. It means that it can be difficult to know how long time it will take for a packet to go from a sender to a receiver. Of course, it has the propagation and the transmission delays, but the queuing delay is a component that can be as big as the other delays, or even bigger. The queuing delay can create problems. For instance, to voice a video transmission, a phone call can be broken up in the voice quality, or a film that you're looking at can freeze. There are also problems of delay when you want to control equipment over the internet or over a packet switch network. How should the packet switch network route a sequence of packets? There are two principles. The datagram, which we also refer to as connectionless, treats the packets independent from one another. It has no knowledge of packets belonging to the same file or, or film or whatever that generate to the packets. It means that the packets need to contain full address information. So the switch only needs to look at the destination address for each packet and decide where it should send them. Should it decide to change the outgoing port, it can do so between two packets of the same belonging to the same transmission. 
which means that packet 1 and 2 could arrive in order 2 and 1 on the receiver if the second packet was sent over a route which was faster than the first packet. Since you don't know which routes the packets will follow, there's no way of reserving resources for a flow end-to-end -end with datagrams. If you want to do that, you can emulate the circuit switching, which we call virtual circuit switching. This is connection-oriented, and it follows the principle of circuit switching. That first, a connection is set up prior to any data transfer. When this connection is set up, it's enough to identify which connection a packet belongs to. And this is called a virtual connection identifier. All packets of a virtual circuit follow the same route, which means that they never arrive out of order, and it's possible to reserve resources for them or for that virtual circuit. That means that you can avoid queuing delays, or you can bound them to some tolerable maximum value, and you could also restrict losses due to congestion, which is a phenomenon that we'll look at into later. This is how it works in a connection-oriented packet switching. The virtual circuit identifier has a limited scope on a link between two switches. So a packet that comes in with virtual circuit identifier 14 to the switch will be uh, going out on a link with a possibly another virtual circuit identifier, because their scope is only a link. And the packets will be changed by the switch by updating the virtual circuit identifier. Here's a bigger example. The virtual circuit here is basically implemented by three tables in the three switches that connect A to B over four different links. The packet come in on switch 1 on port 1 with virtual circuit identity 14, and the table states that it should go out on port 3 using circuit identifier 66. Switch 2 receives the packet on port 1 and recognizes that it has 66 as virtual circuit identifier, and that maps to port 2 with outgoing virtual circuit identifier 22 in switch 2. And the same way it comes into switch 3. And there it says that what comes in on port 2 with virtual circuit 22 should go out to port 3 virtual circuit 77. So here, the circuit is identified both on the port where the packet comes in and the virtual circuit identifier that the packet has on that link. Here I will illustrate the differences between the three switching modes, the circuit switching, the virtual circuit switching, and the datagram. So in circuit switching, there's a call request being sent out. It's processed in each node, which takes some delay. So that's shown here as the difference between the incoming message and outgoing message at each node. The circuit is typically set up in both directions. So when the message reaches the receiver, and if it's willing to accept the connection, it can send back a confirmation to the sender or the initiator. When this confirmation has been reached, the data transfer can take place. And then one of the two parties here, the receiving end, will tear down the connection and the resources will be released. The virtual circuit switching mimics this, as you see. So a signaling packet is, is sent out. This is a message just stating that one party would like to set up a connection to another party. This is being processed in the nodes, as also in the circuit switching. And then, eventually, a call packet will be sent back, confirming the connection from the receiver. But here, when the data is being sent, it's sent as packet. And they could experience queuing delay in the intermediate nodes. And when the virtual circuit has no use any longer, there will be a teardown. Of, and if there have been resources reserved, they will be released. There's a marked difference from these two modes to datagram, because here you see that a, a node that has something to send, if it has the address of the destination it wants to reach, it can start sending packets immediately without any setup. And it's up to the intermediate switches to decide how to route the packets that are coming in. This means also, as I said, that there cannot be any resources reserved in switches, and possibly the queuing delays can be larger here than in the virtual circuit switching case. To 
to conclude and to summarize, I put this table of datagram versus virtual circuit switching, both being instances of packet switching. In datagram, the transmission can start immediately, given that the sender has the address of the receiver. While in virtual circuit switching, first the connection has to be set up, and it takes some time, at least a round trip time, to do. In the datagram, there's no connection state in the switches, but they have forwarding tables. While in the circuit switching, the, the tables map incoming port and VC to uh, outgoing port and VC. Datagram, there's no guarantee that the transmission order is maintained through the network and packets can arrive out of order. While in virtual circuit switching, all packets follow the same route and therefore are guaranteed to arrive in order. In datagram, there is a forwarding decision taken per packet. There could also be changes in the route in between forwarding of different packets. While in virtual circuit switching, there's one routing decision taken per connection, and all packets follow the same route, as I said. Because of the full address information that's required in the datagram, it means that the packet overhead is, is larger. Remark that Internet Protocol version 6 has addresses of 128 bits. In virtual circuit switching, the identifier is only local to the link, and therefore you don't need many identifiers. The overhead in the packet could be smaller. But on the other hand, you have to change the identifier in each switch that the packet passes through. 